All right, so we'll pick up where we left off, which is we're starting to talk about biases that exist in sampling. So I had, um, I think we had just kind of finished talking about the selection bias, which is this idea that they were kind of oversampling with this literary digest poll and they were sending it to people who only own cars and telephones. They were oversampling kind of Republicans, right? Or overselecting. So the other kind of bias that we saw, we could have seen in this situation was, we said even if they sent these 10 million mailers out, 5 million to Republicans, 5 million to Democrats, if Republicans were the only ones that responded, well then that would have caused the same kind of problem in our sample, right? We would have had a sample that had the majority of Republicans, even though we know the country is close to kind of a 50-50 split. So we look at the actual data kind of, this, these people they surveyed like years after the fact, what they found was no matter which category we're looking at, the percent of people that were responding to this, this uh, poll, right, people who would respond to a survey, much higher percent for the people who ended up voting for Landon than the response rate for people who ended up voting for Roosevelt. Now, why is that the case? That's kind of more of a mystery uh, as to why the response rates vary so much between the people who were voting for each one of these types of candidates. You know, there's a discussion about maybe income is linked to you know, time you have available or just even your, uh, how involved people are in politics tends to be, tends to go up as income goes up. Um, but for whatever reason, we had a non-response bias here as well. So not only do they over-select kind of wealthier individuals who are more likely to be leaning right, they also had kind of a response rate that led them with more people there who were Republican than Democrat. So those two things are both gonna push the results kind of to look more skewed towards kind of the Republican candidate winning, which is what they were, even though in fact, the reality, right, who, who ended up actually winning was the Democratic candidate by quite a bit. So what else could go wrong? So we had that, that set up um, last class, thinking about the presidential election, but people, you know, in general, if we're not thinking about just who are they gonna vote for, we're, we're you know, asking them questions or collecting data on income or you know, a million other things, Sometimes people will lie to you, right? If we ever look at like drug use data, like if people are asked about their drug use, they're way, way lower reported amounts than what we actually see kind of play out in sales uh, of drugs and things like that. So sometimes people just don't want you to know whatever it is you're trying to gather data on them, from, you know, whatever you're trying to gather the data on. Non-malicious lying is the idea that, well, if I ask somebody what their income is and they tell me they rounded up to 60,000, well, they probably don't make exactly 60,000, right? They're probably just giving me a ballpark. They're not maliciously lying. They're kind of just non-maliciously, right? They're giving me kind of the, the, their best recollection right, of whatever I'm asking them data or trying to gather information or data on, okay? Uh, kind of more recent, um, people have started looking at how responses to questions vary just by how they're phrased. So people can misunderstand questions also, if you phrase a question with like a, um, oh, someone's presenting something, an undergraduate student did this thing where just phrasing the question in a more negative way can get you more negative responses than if you ask the same question, but phrase it in a more positive light. Right? So if you're asking someone questions about like smoking behaviors, you say, you know, uh, you know, we all are, we all know it's bad for you and you're, you're probably gonna get cancer if you keep smoking, but how, how many packs do you smoke a week, right? Well, geez, now I don't wanna tell you I smoke at all, right? But if you come at me and you're like, well, you know, it, it's just kind of a commonly accepted thing and we're trying to gather information about how many packs a week do you, do you smoke, right? That's phrased in a very different way. That person might be you know, very more responsive in that second, second light than in the first one, right? So how we kind of phrase the question matters. So we can kind of think about some examples and just talk about some of the biases that would exist so we can start to think about, we wanna make sure we get a sample that looks like our population. So let's say I was to ask everybody in this class, right? To rank your health from one to four, right? So I gather everybody's kind of response and then I use your guys' responses about how you would rank your own health to make inferences about the population as a whole. So first of all, what's one selection bias that would exist if I was using kind of everybody in this class here? relative to the population, you guys are all the same age. Yeah, everybody's the same age, right? So I over-selected from an age group, right? And not only did I over-select from an age group, that age group 
likely, right, has higher on average health than the population as a whole, because there's 80 year olds in the population, right? So I have a selection bias kind of just built in if I was to use the people in this class. What would maybe, like, let's say I did ask everybody, but you didn't have to answer. What's maybe a non-response bias that could exist here? What people, if you're asking people to rate their health, might be less likely to respond? Or who might be more likely to respond? If I think that someone's going to be looking at this data, I would probably expect healthier individuals would not really have an, you know, an issue kind of responding if they feel like they're in good health. Whereas if I don't feel like I'm in good health, maybe I don't even want to answer the question, right? I just don't even want to let you know that I don't feel like I'm in good health, right? So maybe there's a non-response bias there. You know, people might just misunderstand the, or misread the question or not understand it. So they might respond with a four because they think I'm in good health and four is the highest number. But when, when you look at kind of, the, you know, how it's supposed to be ranked, four is supposed to be lowest, one's supposed to be the best, right? So, you know, there could be some misunderstanding in the question. People could just lie, right? Um, maybe maliciously, they over-report because they don't want, you know, don't want the person asking to know that they feel like they're in poor health. Or potentially, um, one of the things that we typically see is most people believe they're in worse health than they are. So there's just a kind of an innate bias that exists in this type of question. Um, we already talked about the interpretation. I didn't mention, you know, we talked about selection bias, non-response, but also if I force it to be discreet here, right, I can only answer one, two, three, or four. Well, what if I feel like a 2.5? I didn't have to lie to you, right? When I say lie to you, it's not that you're, you're trying to like, you know, get one over on me. It's just, if you feel like you're a 2.5, you are forced to tell me a two or a three, which will be incorrect, or it will be slightly different than what the true value is, right? So if we force like a continuous variable into discrete, we might have some, some issues there. Another one we can think about, same kind of setup, but I ask you the question of how many alcoholic drinks do you have each week? Well, once again, what's the selection bias that could exist? You guys are college students, so your drinking behaviors are probably a little bit higher than the population as a whole, right? So right away, I've got a selection bias if I'm trying to make statements about the drinking behaviors of the population. Right? Non-response bias, bias here might be what? If you're not, well, drink too much and you might underreport it, right? So there you might have people kind of systematically, maliciously lying, right? Underreporting what they can drink. In fact, it may go as far as if they're not 21 and the person asking them a question, they have any concerns about where this data is gonna go, right? Maybe they just respond with zero, right? Or they don't respond at all. Right? So kind of if we think about anytime there's a potential cost to responding to this question, it might kind of bias our results, right? We might get people under-reporting or reporting a lot of zeros just because they're kind of worried about, you know, if they're not 21, where's this data going? I don't know, you know, I, if I was to ask you, sometimes I use eye clickers to do this, and I always say, I'll, I'll delete this after class, right? So, like, you don't have any concern about that. But what we really do see is, especially when you're collecting uh, data on, I don't want to say, like, illegal activity, but, like, anything where someone's not going to want to kind of maybe report the accurate amount, anonymity helps a lot. So, like, making sure they know, like, their names aren't attached to any of the responses, that there's no kind of identifying characteristics often elicits kind of quite a bit different results um, if you can ensure that an anonymity. Right? Um, so we've got our selection bias, non-response, right? Some people might under-report. Then again, some, you know, they're always the one person at the party who might want to exaggerate it. And then who keeps track, right? People might just non-maliciously lie to you because they're like, well, I, I don't know, about five or six drinks. So I guess I'll go with one through five because that sounds better than six through 12, right? So they're not maliciously lying to you. They're just like, I, I, you know, I don't sit down and keep a record. And so um, these are just kind of all some of the biases that we can think that exist. I think I'll return to this example on Friday just so we get a little bit more of a discussion on separate days, um, but talking about the biases. And I have this paper that kind of looks at the last election and it lets us think about kind of all the bias that, that might have existed in these political polls, right? So we'll kind of revisit this on, on Friday. Because what I want to make sure we kind of have a pretty succinct or at least a, uh, I don't want to leave the discussion in an awkward place. Um, so I want to make sure we start on talking about the distribution of sample means. Okay. So if I had a data set, and let's say I'm looking at income, right? So I go out and I randomly sample 100 people, and then I 
record every person in that sample's income. I would have 100 different income values. I could very easily find the mean, right? So I can find the sample mean from that sample of a size 100. I could then go randomly sample another 100 people, get their incomes, record that sample mean. Go out and sample another, right? I could keep doing this. Eventually, I have like 1,000 different sample means. Well, now that I have 1,000 sample means, I could create like a histogram and look at what the distribution of those sample means are, right? Because I'm not going to see the same sample mean every time. Let's say uh, I looked it up the other day, and I, I think it's probably skewed a little bit if we were to take out people like under 18 and things. But the average kind of reported income in the U.S. is like 32,000 or something like that. Right? So 32,000 dollars. Let's just assume that is the, what the the average income is. Well, if I take a sample of size 100. I might see from that first sample that the average you know, income is, I don't know, 34,000. It's not that far off, right? It sounds reasonable. Like if I just happen to get a couple people that made a little bit more money, my sample mean might be a little bit higher than the overall mean. I then take another sample. That sample mean is, I don't know, 29,000. Well, once again, that's not unlikely for me to see. It's pretty close to what the true mean is. And I've only got 100 out of the whole population, 100 people out of the whole population. You know, but if I take 100 people, what's the likelihood that I, I then see a sample mean of 200,000? Well, that's, that seems kind of unlikely, right? That's pretty far away from what the overall mean of the population is. So for me to see a sample mean of 200,000, right, that's the average of these 100 pe people's incomes, that seems pretty unlikely. So there's certain sample mean values we know are more likely, certain sample mean values we know are less likely, right? There will be a distribution, okay? So what's that distribution going to look like? Well, one thing that we quickly figure out is it depends on what our sample size taking was. When I use the example of 100 people, well, yeah, seeing a sample mean of 200,000, you know, the, the average of 100 people's income is 200,000, that seems unlikely. But if my sample sizes are of size one, well, it's very, uh, very reasonable that I could see one person have an income of 200,000. It's a little bit more likely than seeing the average income across 100 people being 200,000. So the distribution of my sample means will depend on what that sample size is, lowercase n. Okay? So if we're looking at all these different sample sizes, and we know that the sample size will influence the distribution that we see for these sample means, what can we actually say? Like, How is it going to impact it? Well, what ends up being true is that the sample means, that distribution of my sample means, there's a thousand different samples I took, will be centered around or have a mean that is whatever the true population mean was, right? So if I take a thousand different samples, their mean, right, the kind of mean across those sample means would be exactly what the population income, or sorry, population mean income was, which was that 31,000. Okay? Now, there's a proof for this, but I'm actually gonna prove it to you with data today. So we'll hold on to this, but for right now, just accept it as true. And I'll have a picture here in a second to show you. What ends up also being true is that the variance of our sample means is the original variance of the data we're sampling from divided by my sample size. Okay? So what this is saying is, well, yeah, if my sample size is one, right, I'm just selecting one observation and then calculating the sample mean from that. Well, I'm just going to have the original distribution I started with, right? Because that's essentially what, when we're looking at the population distribution, we're looking at samples of size one, right? Each observation is, is just representing one person. So then as I increase my sample size, right, I start taking, taking, taking samples of size 10 and then 100. If that denominator gets larger, what's going to happen to the variance of my sample means? The denominator goes up and the whole fraction gets smaller, right? Dividing by a larger number, I'm going to reduce the variance on my sample mean distribution, right? So taking higher sample sizes will reduce the variance. We'll return to this in just a second, but I want to kind of oops, move the dot cam and give you a visual to go along with this. All right. Okay, perfect. So, we start out kind of sampling from this I mean. This could be, I don't know, this variable could be income, right? And we know that the distribution of income has its own mean and it has kind of its own variance. 
If I then start to uh, take samples, maybe of size 10, right, and calculate the sample mean from that sample of size 10, then sample another 10 people, get that sample mean. Get another 10 people, calculate that sample mean. The distribution of my sample means will also be distributed normally around whatever that original population mean was, but for my sample means, the variance will be the original variance that I had here divided by my sample size. Now, one thing to kind of maybe make this make a little more sense, if I think about my original variable X, instead of income, let's do height, right? There is some probability associated with seeing someone who is seven feet tall, right? It's relatively low. There's not a lot of people that are that tall, but it is a non-zero probability. Like it, it, it's not the most unlikely thing. If I'm selecting a person at random, there is some likelihood that we could get someone who's seven feet tall. If I think about, let's say I take samples of size 100, what's the probability that the sample mean height of those 100 people is seven feet tall? Well, I mean, that, that would mean that my sample is primarily filled with people who are, are you know, close to seven feet tall if I'm getting a mean that's seven feet tall. And so when I have 100 people, it's just way less likely that I see that the average height of all the 100 people is seven feet tall, as opposed to the probability of just one person being seven feet tall. So these values that are very far away from the mean, when I'm looking at the distribution of my sample means, well, because I'm no longer just looking at one person, I'm looking at samples of a certain size, that variance, right, these, these values that are really far from the mean are going to become way less likely. It's almost impossible for me to see a sample mean of seven feet tall across 100 people. And so when I'm saying that the extreme values are less likely, well, that means the values near the mean must be more likely or that the variance is lower, right? That it's not as likely for me to see things far away from the mean. Okay? So when we take higher sample sizes, we're going to greatly reduce the variance of these sample means, right? And it kind of plays out the mathematics because if I'm increasing the denominator, right, it's going to reduce, reduce that overall fraction. Okay. Any questions on this before we keep moving? See if it switches over. Nope. Um, maybe. There we go. So for right now, like I said, I'll prove this to you with some, some data here in a second, but for now, just believe me that this is true. Okay. So I already kind of mentioned there's two things that'll influence this variance. One, if the original variance of the data goes up, then the variance of our sample means goes up, right? There's just a wider range of values we could see, you know, from the original data, then there's a wider range of values we could see for the sample mean. Also, this idea that if I start taking higher and higher sample sizes, well, maybe, you know, let's go back to the height one. Maybe if I only have sample sizes of two, I can still see a sample mean of, of seven feet tall. But by the time I get to 100, that's not very likely. And that's because those extreme values are becoming less and less likely when I have a larger sample size. Or as n is going up, it's going to drive down the variance of the standard deviation of my sample means. Okay. So this is good for us. Um, oh, if I want to think about it, I did want to mention this. So for the standard deviation, we'll just take the square root of that variance. But here we'll start writing it in two different ways. Kind of depends on what the information we were originally given is. But both of these things are mathematically identical, right? It's just that when I take the square root of this variance of my sample means, square root of something squared is just itself. So you could rewrite this as the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. But these two things are the same. And we're in it's the same process. To get the standard deviation, we just take the square root of the variance. Okay? And I, well, this is a rule of thumb that we need to make sure that our samples aren't too big, but we never really have to, to worry about this. Um, because the population sizes we're dealing with are so large. So let's think of an example here. I'll kind of draw this out for you. So let's say I've got all these births from Indiana in a certain year. Right? So I have the original population data and I can go in and I can calculate the population mean birth weight was 3,287 grams and the variance was 360,000. 
So then from this population data set, I then randomly sample 36 of the births, right? From these 36 births, I determine what the, um, you know, the sample mean is, and I jot that down. I then take another 36 births, right? Take that sample mean, write that number down. Randomly sample another 36. I keep doing this until I have like, I don't know, a couple thousand sample means. I could then look at and graph out that distribution of those sample means. If I did that, what should be true is that they're centered around the original mean of the data I was sampling from, right? And I have that population data here. And that the variance of my sample means, oh, here, sorry, actually it's a standard deviation of my sample means, will be the original variance divided by my sample size. And then because I want the standard deviation, I'll have to take the square root. So kind of what this looks like. I'll just draw this out in the context of this example to give us a little bit more practice with this if I can get the papers out. All right. So I started out, I have all these birth weights. I see that they're normally distributed. The mean is 3,287. The variance is 360,000. Right. So when I'm looking at Excuse me. I was gonna say I'm gonna sneeze. When I'm looking at the distribution of my sample means, those should be centered around whenever the true population mean is. So the mean of my sample means is whatever the mean of the original data I sampled from was. Okay. Now the variance of my sample means will just be the original variance over my sample size. So what, 360,000 divided by 36. So I get 10,000. I wanted the standard deviation. So that would be the square root of the variance that I found, not 100,000, sorry, 10,000. Right. And I get that the standard deviation is 100. Any questions on that? So, you know, I have to be given the, the variance and the, the mean and the variance of the original data. Otherwise, I, I don't know what the distribution of my sample means is going to look like. But if I have those two pieces of information, I can then determine what the mean and the standard deviation of my sample means is going to be. Okay. All right. So, we just found this, right? We had a mean of 3,027, standard deviation of 100. If I do the same thing, but now I'm thinking about the distribution, when I take samples of size 100, excuse me, what's gonna happen? Well, instead of, well, here, I wanna, here we go. So I have the same variance in the original data, but now my sample size is going up, right? From 36 to 100. So if my sample size goes up, what's gonna happen to the overall fraction? Going to go down, right? I'm dividing by a larger number. And so a higher sample size should lead to a lower standard deviation. So I'm going to have the exact same setup, but now with 100 babies in my sample, the mean will still be that original mean of the, the data, but now it's going to be the variance divided by 100, right? So it's going to decrease my variance or my standard deviation, where if before it was 100, now I know it has to be less than 100, so I know that given these options, one of the answers where the standard deviation is 60 has to be right, right? Higher sample size drives the standard deviation of the variance down, so I know that it has to be below 100, and I know that the mean has to be the original mean, so here we could answer C. Now I could go ahead, actually, I wanted this, there we go. I could go ahead and basically just go through this formula again, but plug in n is 100 instead of 36, and I'll end up solving that the standard deviation is in fact 60. But here, knowing that principle that as I take a higher sample size, it's going to drive down the variance of my sample means, I could have kind of figured this one out without even plugging any of those numbers in. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. So, I've kind of already described this, this idea, but as we take larger and larger samples, it's gonna drive down our variance, right? 
So we kind of think about why, like let's say we had, I don't know, this is a car mileage or something, but it doesn't matter what the variables we're looking at. When I look at the original data, it might be very spread out, right? So that the values near the mean aren't quite as likely, the values far from the mean are still pretty likely for us to see. Well, you're kind of thinking about the height example, right? This could be that, yeah, I can see people who are, you know, I don't know, four foot 10 and people who are, are six foot eight, right? Really short, really tall. But once I start taking sample sizes that are higher, right? Sample size five, well, seeing a, the average height be six, eight in those five people is less likely than just seeing one person be six, eight, right? So those extreme values, notice they're not even, the probability is essentially zero out here now. And the values near the mean start to become more and more likely. Then if I go to a sample size of 50, well now, you know, if I'm looking at sample, you know, heights of 50 people, I start to see like, you know, 5'8", 5'10", 5'7", 5'11", right? I'm seeing values that are centered around where that kind of average height is for the population as a whole. Okay? I'm not seeing 6'10", right, in my sample means of sample size 50, right? So now I'm only seeing values really close to the mean, and these values that are further from the mean, essentially, the probability has become almost zero of seeing that. Right? So higher sample sizes are driving down the variance, which means we're getting these more peaked distributions, right? We kind of already talked about this in, in the past, um, and this kind of makes sense, right? As I'm getting a larger sample, I'm just get, getting more information, right, about where the true, if I'm not able to see what the true population mean is, then just having a higher sample, I have more information about the population, right? I have more individuals out of that population. So I should be able to get a better guess about where that population mean is. Well, think about it. If I'm getting a really high sample size and I'm able to like really, really reduce the variance, then I'm starting to get probabilities of seeing values only close to the mean. Like those are the only values I'm seeing. Well, now, even if I don't know what the population mean is, I can take one sample and I know it's more likely that sample mean it's closer to what the population mean is. If my samples are only of size two, I don't know, I could just get a, a, you know, a, bad, a bad, bad sample of two people, right? It's much harder to get like a unaccurate or unrepresentative sample if I'm taking a thousand people. Right? Excuse me, all right. So we looked at a similar graph to this in the past where it's like, as I look at higher sample sizes, notice I'm getting this kind of more peaked distribution representing that values near the mean are more likely, okay? So we've already talked about this a little bit before where the mean shifted our normal distribution, the variance, right, as the variance went down, it gave us a more peaked distribution. Or when the sample size gets lower, that's gonna drive our variance up, that's gonna make our distribution flatter with a higher variance. Because right? the flatter it gets, it means that values further from the mean are now more likely, right? That's having a high variance. So um, if I'm starting out with this distribution that's normally distributed, I know, whoop, I know the sample means, not only will the mean of my sample means be the original mean of the data I sampled from, but the variance of my sample means is the original variance of the data I sampled from divided by my sample size. So not only do I know that, but I know that if the original variable was normally distributed, the sample mean distribution will also be normally distributed, okay? Once again, I'm gonna prove this to you with some, some data here in a second. So, what ends up being true though is even if the original variable wasn't normally distributed, as long as I take a sample size over 30, the sample means will be normally, or, uh, normally distributed. So, if I go back, even if this was um, uniformly distributed, the original variable, the, uh, the distribution of my sample means will not be uniformly distributed. If I take a sample over size 30, it'll be approximately normally distributed. So it doesn't matter what the original variable starts out as, as long as, oh, what did I just do? All right. I wanted it. Oh, hold on. I'm holding control, there we go, <laughs> right? So it doesn't matter what this original variable starts out as distributed the sample means will be normally distributed as long as I meet that limit of, of 30, right? I have a sample size over 30, okay? And then as we get higher and higher sample sizes, it's not just approximately a normal distribution, we get closer and closer to like the actual exact normal distribution. 
So I'll kind of show you kind of some non-data what this would look like. So here's four different variables. They all start out not normally distributed, right? These are different types of distributions, but none of them are normal. I then look at samples of size two, the distribution of a sample means of sample size two. Oh, not really normally distributed yet. Once I get to six, this one looks pretty close to a normal. This one's pretty close. These two are still a little bit skewed. Once I get to sample sizes 30, I mean, these are just kind of nice, tight, normal distributions where only the values kind of centered around that mean are the actual ones that are, are, are likely for me to see, right? That have probabilities that are kind of above zero. And then the values further from that true population mean are not very likely for me to see. But it didn't matter which one of these variables I started out with, by the time I get to samples of size 30, the distribution of the sample means all look normally distributed. Okay. So here's the, what I wanted to make sure we get through. So if I had this data set of Indiana births, right? So in 2004, every birth in Indiana, and it looks like, um, well, about 87,000 people. Some of the variables I had a couple more than others, but I've got birth weight, uh, gestation period or length of the pregnancy, this health score of a child, the APGAR score, and then whether or not the, the mother smoked during pregnancy, right? So this last variable is just a one, zero. One if they did, zero if not. So if I look at um, the means and the standard deviations, right, for the entire population, I've got my mean birth weight, kind of gestation or length of the pregnancy, whether or not the mother used tobacco, and then kind of this health score, right? So most babies are healthy, right, 10 being the highest. Um, about 18% of Indiana mothers smoked during pregnancy at one point. Um, average length of pregnancy, 39 weeks, and birth weight, about 3,300 3, grams. So I have the original standard deviations, right? And we can look at what the distribution of the variables look like as well. So here's birth weight. Kind of notice it's got a pretty nice normal distribution. It starts out normally distributed. I told you a lot of these biological measures, they're just normally distributed by nature. So this is one of those, right? If I look at length of the pregnancy, eh, not really normal, a little bit long, long left tail, right? We can see premature births. We don't usually see babies born like at 11 months, right? So we have a short right tail and this long left tail. The APGAR score, that's measure of health, same kind of idea. Most of them are scored as a nine. This doesn't even start out as a continuous variable, right? The original variable isn't continuous, but our sample mean values can be, right? Even if I can only see you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or 10. When I calculate the mean across 63 people, maybe is my sample size, I can see all the decimal values in between as well. So my sample means are still continuous. And then I didn't draw the graph, I didn't draw the graph, but from eternal smoking it would just be a, a zero and a one, and the zero bar would have went up to 0.18, and the one bar went up to 0.82, right? Because we only had two outcomes there. So these are definitely not starting out normally distributed. The maternal smoking one is definitely not normal, right? It's just two bars. So what happens when I start taking samples? So if I take sample sizes of 100, right? Randomly select 100 of these births and then calculate the sample mean birth weight, sample mean kind of gestation, sample mean APGAR score, sample mean maternal smoking. I then select another 100 people, calculate the sample means or 100 births, calculate the sample means for, the, for those 100 births, I just record this and I do this a thousand times. So I now have a thousand sample means for birth weight, a thousand sample means for gestation weeks, a thousand sample means for APGAR score, and a thousand sample means for maternal smoking. Well, I can calculate, if I had these like in Excel, I can pretty easily find the mean and the standard deviation of those 1,000 sample means. I can also pretty easily create it, oop, almost dropped my marker, create a histogram, right? So hopefully, if what I'm telling you is true, that when I created these 1,000 random samples, the mean of those sample means should be the original mean of the population data. And the standard deviation of those sample means should be the original standard deviation, if we go back, divided by, oh, I had it on the slide, where is it? Uh, there we go. Oh, there it is. The original standard deviation divided by the square root of n, which if n was 100, my sample size are 100, divided by 10. So all these standard deviations that we saw, 
when I look at the standard deviations of my sample means, those 1,000 sample means I took, it should be the original standard deviation divided by 10 or move the decimal one place, right? So sure enough, I took 1,000 different samples and calculated the sample means. And I then from those 1,000 sample means, I found the mean of the sample means and the standard deviation of those 1,000 sample means. And what ends up being true is they're a little off, right? Like if I round this, I think they were closer than this. These are round to the, the integer, right? There was like, you know, 3,287.4 and 3,287.9 or something, right? So it's a little bit off, right? Once again, we're a little bit off on gestation, closer on tobacco use in the APGAR score, but essentially the mean of my sample means is whatever the original population mean was. And these are a little off because I'm only taking a thousand samples. What I actually need for the mean of my sample means, if I was actually gonna like do a data exercise to truly get at it, I would need like an infinite or like a really, really high number of sample, not just a thousand. I need like 10,000 for it to get really, really precise. Right? But in theory, right, the theory is that if we were able to look at all of the sample means, right, an infinite number, then they would be centered around, but still pretty close, right? The data can kind of prove to us that this is, this is happening, right? This is holding true. Then if we look at the original standard deviations, then the standard deviation of my sample mean should be the original standard deviation divided by 10 or the square root of n, square root of 100, which is 10. Sure enough, 600 up here, 60. This should be 0.266. It's rounded to the second decimal. It was actually even closer than what this looks like because of the rounding. 0.38 should be you know, 0 0.038. We'll round to the second decimal, 0 0.04. 0 0.82 should be 0 0.08. Once again, that's exactly what we're getting. Okay. So we could look at the mathematical proof if we're really getting interested in this, but the data kind of proves that this holds to us, right? That the distribution of my sample means has a mean, that's the original mean of the data I sampled from, and a standard deviation, which would be the original standard deviation divided by the square root of my sample size. Okay. I could do this again, and instead of taking samples of size 100, to take samples of size 200, and I could, you know, figure out that as I, you know, I can prove this to myself in a bunch of different ways. But this is, I think, pretty good proof. So the next thing I said that I, I should have to, to show you with this data is, not only did I tell you that this procedure, that the mean of my sample means is the population mean, the standard deviation is the, of our sample mean is the original standard deviation by the square root of n, I also told you these sample means will be normally distributed. Right? So let's take a look at them. So here's birth weight, notice, the original birth weight variable was already normally distributed. So it's not very surprising that, if I can get down there again, that the sample mean birth weights also looks normally distributed. Now it looks like it's normally distributed, but if we go back to the original variable, I was seeing values as low as five, 500 to 800 grams, right? These are kind of like premature births. And I'm seeing, you know, some values up here, not very many, but like above 5,000. When I take samples of size 100, my new variance is much, much smaller, right? Because I'm dividing by n, dividing by that 100. So my distribution of the sample means that I was calculating for birth weight should be a much smaller kind of range of values, right? It should be more tight around whatever that true population mean is. So sure enough, notice the lowest values I'm seeing for my sample means are like 3,000. Well, that's because it's unlikely for me to get a sample of 100 births that are all premature births. That's why I'm not seeing like a sample mean of 800 grams, right? So looking at our distribution of our sample means, it's going to be much kind of tighter, right? Or it's going to have a much kind of lower um, variance. The values I'm going to see are going to be much more centered around whatever that true mean is. Okay. Any questions on, on this? Make sure I stop in 10 minutes. All right, similar idea. If we look at the length of the pregnancy, right? Very, cent I mean, it only has a range of what, 37 to 39, so about two weeks, right? I've got this really nice kind of low variance, tight distribution, and the distribution is no longer left skewed like the original variable. The, the distribution of my sample means is this nice normal distribution. Same kind of idea for that health score. You can maybe argue this still has a little bit of a left tail, right? And this is where we said, well, it's going to be approximately a normal distribution. 
right? It's not going to be exact, but it's going to be approximate. And if I were to take a higher sample, right, maybe instead of 100, 200 births, this would look even more like close to an approximation of a normal distribution. And I look at maternal smoking. I've got kind of some weird things, you know, going up and down here a little bit. You can kind of imagine it's pretty getting close to a normal distribution. And that was the variable that started out. It wasn't even continuous. It was just a zero one, right? But, you know, this is, I think, pretty good proof that it doesn't matter what the original variable starts out as. If we take enough, you know, have a high enough sample size, we can get approximately a normal distribution for each one of these variables. Okay. All right, any, any questions before we keep moving here? Um, I think we'll try to work through one. So let's say, uh, you know, now that I know a little bit more about the distribution of sample means, I can start to think what I'm actually going to have to do in, in practice. So we're going to have these steps. Oops. It's going to be very similar to what we were doing before, right? So before we had some original variable, maybe this was height. And I said, okay, well, if I know that it's a normal distribution with this mean and this variance, tell me the probability that somebody is, you know, 64 inches tall or shorter. Okay, we turn that 64 into a Z value, look that up in the table, found the area to the left. Sometimes, you know, if I had said, well, what's the probability it's 64 inches or greater? Well, then I could use the table, but the table told me the area to the left. I wanted the area to the right. So I had to do this last step, which was kind of subtract it from one, right? Sometimes I had like some transformation to do those probabilities. But really, it's going to be the same procedure as what we were doing before. But now we're going to say something like, all right, I know that if I take samples of size 36 here, that this will be the distribution of my sample means. So what's the probability that, I don't know, I see a sample mean of 3,000 or lower, right? Well, this is just a normal distribution. As long as I took a sample size over 30, I know my sample means will have a normal distribution. I know the mean and I know the variance. So before what I was doing was to create my z-score. I was taking the cutoff value I was interested in, subtracting the mean, divided by the standard deviation. Now I'm going to find a z-score, but using the distribution of my sample means. Well, now I'm interested in a certain cutoff value for my sample mean, so that would be the 3,000. I'm going to subtract the mean of my sample means, which is that 3,287, and I'm going to divide by the standard deviation of my sample means, which we actually had right here. So same kind of process. I can turn this value, this value for my sample mean, 3,000, into a z-score, look that z-score up on the table, find the area to the left, which would be essentially the probability that I see a sample mean that was this low or anything below it. So it's the same kind of procedure, but our z-score equation is going to be a little bit different because I can actually write this as, bear with me since I'm running out of room here, divided by, so if I'm divided by the standard deviation of my sample means, that's the same thing as like the square root of the original variance over my sample size. So the equation starts to look a little bit different. And I have that in a slide that I'll switch back to here in just a second. All right? It follows the same kind of format. We take some cutoff value, and now we're not just interested in x, we're interested in kind of x bar or sample mean values. Subtract the mean of whatever you're looking at. So here, we're just looking at the original variable x, we subtracted the mean of x. Now that we're looking at sample means, we subtract the mean of our sample means. Divide by the standard deviation. Well, now that we're looking at sample means, divide by the standard deviation of our sample means. Right? Same, same kind, of, kind of procedure. Right? And so that's why another way we could write that z-score, right? I, I think I had it as the square root of the variance over the sample size, but we said another way that we could write that is the original standard deviation divided by the square root of that. Right? So either, either way is really saying the same thing. So let's... I think go through yeah, four minutes. Mm. I don't know if I want to rush through this. Um, well, we can do one here. So uh, actually, I'll, we'll, we'll stop there.
I mean, if we got four minutes left, I, I don't want to rush through this example. Um, but you can imagine, right? We kind of already did it here. Oops, actually, I'll just share the whole thing. Right? I have all the values that I need here, right? I mean, I could take 3,000, subtract 3,287, divide by, what, 100? So I'm going to get, what, 287 divided by 100, so 2.87. So I'm 2.8 standard deviations away from that mean there. I then go to the table, look up negative 2.8. It'll tell me the area to the left, and now I've got what I want. So it's the same procedure as what we were doing before. It just took a little bit more work to calculate things like the standard deviation. We had to know this principle that the mean of my sample means is the original mean of the data we sampled from. Um, but really, we were kind of connecting back to what we were talking about before we started talking about like sampling and the you know, biases that exist. So we'll pick up with some more examples on Friday. Um, I'll kind of go through that, that Trump bias. I'll actually get a, a paper up there on Canvas that we'll maybe take a look at as well. And uh, you've got that connect assignment out there. Um, so, you know, let's do what I had that next Friday, I believe. So start making sure you work on that, get the questions to me as early as possible. Other than that, I think that should be be good. Um, I'll put an online quiz up today that'll be due Friday before we start class. And um, other than that, I will see you guys on Friday and enjoy the uh, the nice weather again. <laughs>